Welcome to Creative Mind. I'm your host, Bobby Brill, and in this episode, we dive deeper into the world of children's books, this time with illustrator Ada Kavan. In fact, she's a very prolific illustrator for somebody who has a relatively young career. Her books, such as Old MacDonald Had a Truck and Even Superheroes Have Bad Days, are very, very cute and very enjoyable. And she has some great insight in working in today's climate, working with existing IP like Star Wars and Disney, and just working with publishers on a regular basis and building out a work schedule as a freelancer. So please hit subscribe on whatever device you're listening to so you never miss an episode of Creative Mind, because also coming up, we've got some great episodes with some book editors and some book marketers to kind of give you a perspective on the other side of this business so that you've got the illustrators, the authors, and the people who write the checks. That's the most important part. But without further ado, here is Ada Kabak. Ada, tell me where are you from? Because your accent is just a little bit different than mine. I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. Istanbul, yeah. okay. Not Constantinople. <laughs> it, it is Constantinople, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how, how do you describe yourself then? Do you describe yourself as a children's book illustrator or an editorial illustrator? How is it that you describe the work that you do? I usually say children's book illustrator, but if I wanted to describe myself even like broader and better, I would say narrative illustrator because I love telling stories and I love narrative illustration. And um, well, children's book is narrative illustration. So, but yeah, I, I, I make children's books. How did that happen? Because that seems very niche. And then looking at your work, I mean, you seem, I hate, it's, it's a tough word to use, but you seem prolific at this. Oh, thank I mean, you. You're, you're constantly making children's books, it seems. Yeah, I am making a few. So children's books, actually, I was introduced to children's book literature after I studied or after I started studying at Academy. Growing up in Turkey, it's very different than growing up in the U.S. And kid literature was not as developed over there when I was little. It's much better now. So I didn't know that you could do so much work. And, you know, there's so many like beautiful picture books that are illustrated gorgeously. And I had no idea. So when I started taking studio classes in the illustration department, I was eventually introduced to children's books. And I was just like in awe of all the illustrations. And I realized that I could do that for a living. So that's how it started. What makes a children's book now that you've done so many of them, what makes a children's book different than, say, a cartoon? Huh. I am not really sure how to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. I stumped you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think mainly age group definitely is a big difference. Okay. Picture books are usually like age three to eight or so. While there are comics books for kids, of course, but um, it's more for grown-ups. So the stories are different. The way the stories are written different. I think the narrative is different. Because I, I, when I look at your work and I look at a lot of other children's books illustrators, the really good ones, which I'm, I'm putting you in that category, there is a, uh, it does have this comic-y editorial, you know, it's very lively. It's not a simple. I think that's why children's book is so beautiful. The style is so rich, like, it's not one style fits at all, you know, like it can look very editorial. It can look like it can look like comics or it can look like um, gouache paintings. It can be any medium. I, I think it's very rich. So it's it's really beautiful that way. And what kind of medium are you using? You said gouache. Are you doing like watercolors, gouache and traditional media? Or are you working digitally? I'm mostly working digitally now, but I am when I do traditional paintings, I like gouache and I study it with gouache, too. Pencil, color pencils, gouache, those are my favorite mediums. And I, even though I work digitally like 99.9% .9 now, everything I do like resembles what I do traditionally too. I work in a very similar way, like the way I layer or, um, you know, how I proceed from start to end. It's very similar to like gouache painting. So walk me through that process of when you're, you're just starting out. Are you doing traditional sketches and going into Photoshop and scanning it or... I used to do that because I wasn't comfortable drawing digitally. After I bought a Cintiq and started drawing in a screen, it was like a whole another level for me. And I started drawing digitally and like now I don't have to like, it saves so much time because it's easy to revise. 
rescale things and move things around a little bit because you get so many revisions when you do the sketches. The sketches is like it, there are two or three rounds of revisions on it when you make a book. So it, now it makes it a lot faster and I don't have to scan and all that. But now I just, I just yeah, work with a digital pencil. <laughs> well, well, let's get into how you came to the Academy, what brought you to the U.S., and what was that journey like? Were you studying art in Turkey? Or was that something that you picked up when you came here? That's actually an interesting question. So I studied straight out of high school computer engineering, if you can believe that. And I, I hated it. I mean, it was a love and hate thing. Like I loved math and I was good at it. And I got into a good school with a good scholarship. So like, of course, I'm coming from a non-artist family. So I was immediately pushed that way. But obviously I was miserable and <laughs> it didn't take me too long to quit. I, first, I took like some, you know, like drawing, sketching classes and some Photoshop classes. I went back down, like design, design classes, but like nothing was really itching that scratch, like enough. And then I eventually got into a design school over there, but it was um, more on like graphic design and website design, which back then was a huge thing. And in Turkey, there's no illustration or whatsoever. And it's really? getting better, but yeah, there's like fine art painting and all that, but like there's no illustration department at all. Why, why is that? Is that is that a cultural thing or? It's well, of course, it's not an as developed country. So like even arts is still like in the develop. It's, it's developing just like anything else. And there's one school that is animation, and I think the the quality isn't like can be compared. You know, like if you wanna say do editorial illustrations, you wanna move to New York. You know, if you wanna like work in animation, you wanna move to LA. So I just wanna go to the heart of it. And even the design school, like it wasn't as much drawing and design. As, it wasn't as much as I wanted to do. So, and I was like, this is not going to work out. So I just like made a big decision of moving here. And I think I needed to, like, it's a big decision to leave, like where you're from, your family, like leave everything behind and go to a country that is like across the world or ocean. Yeah, 10,000 miles away. Easy. Exactly. I literally like woke up one morning. I'm like, I'm, I'm just not happy here. I'm leaving. This is not going to work out. So it was a very fast decision. And I had a few cities in mind and San Francisco is like, it was one of the top three and in a couple other cities in Europe and Canada. And I was like, I'm going to San Francisco. I'm like what, what art schools are there in San Francisco? And I started researching and there was Academy and I came to Academy and I loved it. Like, it was great. I loved the city. I loved the Academy. I would never advise anyone to make that decision that fast, but I got very lucky. I loved where I lived. I loved where I studied. I liked my teachers. Like it was, it, it worked out, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, no, I'm going to say it's a good decision to make because I made the, de- I worked overseas in China for eight years and I had like a week to make a decision. I was like, fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You, you're going to pay me. All right, fine. See ya. I'm out. I think that's how it needs to be. Like if you keep like drilling on, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work out. So I was also one of the older students too. Like I was almost like mid twenties and stuff while they were almost like 18. <laughs> There's definitely those those two or three groups in an art school. It's fresh out of high school. High school, yeah. I'm over 21. I kind of figured out what I want to do now. Then I, I totally agree. Art is is it's always a journey, you know, like from start to end. So, what were you learning that made you just go, boom? This is the moment for me to be an illustrator. This is I know I want to do this. What were, what what happened? Chuck Pyle would bring us his paintings, like the stuff he did, you know, like as a professional illustrator, and he would show us like his process and final paintings and like his experience with an art directors. And I don't know, it just sounded like so fascinating. <laughs> and he would tell us like what he had to change and like how like how he stayed up late at night to finish the painting. And I was like, this is amazing. Like now I'm like, this is torture. <laughs> I was going to say, Chuck really sells it. You listen to Chuck, you're like, yeah, yeah, I could do that too. And you know, his paintings are gorgeous and everything. And I'm like, I want to do that. I loved like how teachers were like experienced in the field and like how they would like bring the work they did. And I don't know, I just remember like wanting to be one of them. (laughs) There was always like talk of, like I took classes, a lot of classes in fine art. So there was always like this talk of like, how do you make a living with your art? How do you make a living with your art? And it's just like, yeah, like I want to make a living with my art, you know, like it's, you're just so passionate and there's so many passionate people around you that, um, you know, elevates that feeling. People who are going to art school have that question. And certainly the people who are 
the supporting players for that person going to art school, parents, friends, mentors, the people writing the check. How did you start making money as an illustrator? Oh, man. So I'm not going to lie. It's tough in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, my toughest my 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 toughest days were like the first days or maybe the first year out of school well when i was like trying to make a living with art and it was like not happening because there was like rejection after rejection and you're trying to break in the industry it's 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 tough the beginning especially i mean and it, it really depends what kind of field or what field you want in illustration too if you want like full-time work, do you want freelance? But like I've, I've freelance and I've been freelancing for like seven, eight years at least now. It builds up your clients and the amount of work you do. So in the beginning, it might be hard while you're getting like one or two gigs a year, but then it's like a snowball effect, you know, like it gets more and if the clients are happy, they come back. One client tells another and you have more work to show in your portfolio or on social media or whatever. So it gets better as you go. I mean, you have found your success now. We're going to definitely dive deeper into children's books and that narrative storytelling. What were some of those things you found that didn't work that in that first year or two where you were like, I'm getting rejected on stuff? And not that, you know, what you had done was bad. We all get rejected for whatever reason, tone, style. It's part of the game. It's, yeah. What didn't go was like, the art directors can tell if your heart is in that work or not, or in that field or not. So straight out of school, of course, I had this like anxiety of how I'm, how I'm going to pay my bills. Am I going to pay, pay the rent or whatever, you know? So I, w I was applying to anything I could find, you know, anything that could be a fit or anything that I thought I could do and would pay the bills. But there's so many people applying for the same job and they can tell from your portfolio what you want or they should be able to tell, you know? And because my portfolio was not tailored towards like what I was applying to, they were like, okay, I know you just want a job and you want to make money, but we, we want people who are actually passionate about what, what they're going to do at this work. You know what I mean? Ooh, that's, a, that, that's a tough thing to hear. <laughs> I just spent four years in school. I know. And I was like, yeah, I'm not actually like really passionate about like this job. I just want a job, you know? So basically like it can't be that way. You need to really tailor your portfolio towards like what you really want to do and really pursue that. So like the little shortcuts like didn't work out for me because I did a job here and there like to just like survive for a few months like that. It just didn't work. Then what, what was that first big gig for you that made you feel like, okay, this is, I'm going in the right direction. This is what I want to do. So I, I really do not know why or how I got that gig, but my first big gig was from Lufthansa Airlines. They were doing a big, and this is before like I had represent, representation. So, you know, my name was not out at all, or I thought it wasn't. They were doing a project that they were hiring like illustrators from different countries representing their country they live in. And it's like, you know, like here is, I don't know, Austria. And here you can fly here with Lufthansa kind of advertising. So they chose me for the US. I was very flattered and was like, of course I'm gonna do it. And that was my first big gig. And it had, um, it gave me a lot of exposure. It, the advertising gig was out a lot. And also it got into the society, that piece, Society of Illustrators. Yeah, that gave me big exposure and it was like, that's when I was like, okay, I can, I can do this. This is going to work out somehow. Um, I think that it, it gave me confidence that someone legit actually reached out to me. <laughs> <laughs> and was that, that was more of an edit, was that more of a uh, editorial piece? It was advertising. So as you were going, you were doing more advertising and ed editorial or what, what the stuff you were starting out with? In the beginning I had, in my portfolio, I had pieces for children's books. I had editorial and like lifestyle advertising and lifestyle advertising and editorial were very similar to each other. So basically those, let's say two fields, let's say like lifestyle and children's books. And I was getting gigs from both. And as I went, I just, I did so many more children's books and I love it a lot that my portfolio is now like 90% or 10% probably. I don't know if that's a good thing, but you know, again, looking at your, your list of books, yeah, I think you're. I think you're doing okay. Not bad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, what what was the first book that you did? Old MacDonald had a truck. It was Chronicle Books. Again, I never thought I would be driving trucks or anything, but it was a really fun book. And 
it happened like maybe only a week after I signed with my agent back then. And I was already like talking with Chronicles a little bit. I think signing with an agent like really made that process even faster for some reason. And I, I was asked to do this book and it was my debut and the author's debut. Sometimes publishers bring like two first time illustrator authors together. In your process of working on the book, were you working with the author directly or was it a totally separate hands off? Totally separate. I don't think they even come to illustrators before they're done with the writing side with the author. The author is done, the writing is finished, and then they reach out to the illustrator and publisher handles, handles it very separately. So you don't even talk to the author. You do get notes from them like through the art director or the editor, but you don't talk to each other. I think everyone is very... Or the publisher wants like wants to handle it separately. That to me seems so weird because I know uh, other il- illustrators I've talked to have said, "I'm like, I know, I know." How do you not talk to the person who wrote it, even just to listen to him or go, uh, "Yeah, I don't like your idea," but I listen to you. You know, I think it makes it. I don't know if it's easier or harder because I don't really, I can't really compare it to anything, to be honest. But everything I do or everything I draw, like from the first initial sketches, it does go to the author. Okay. Author has a say on it because, you know, author is the one who comes with the idea and they have a vision of the book and I'm the one who's visualizing it. So I'm adding so much more on top of that, but I still have to stay true to the vision of the author, like why this book is being created. So author definitely gives feedback, but they're more hands off after they're done with the writing. You know, they're, they're done with the writing. The visual part is my job, you know, doing the illustration. So since the writing is done, it's mostly with me. But after the pictures are done, or not the pictures, but the sketches are done, there are times that the words need to be edited, simply not because they're changing the story, but like there might be repetition between the words and the pictures. And then sometimes it goes back to the author. They work a little bit more and comes back. That can be a little back and forth. Okay. So there's a little bit of yeah. the author pulling from you, you pulling from the author. Okay. And if it's an author you worked before and you already know each other, so we obviously can't talk. It's not like it's like forbidden to talk, but... A lot of times you don't know each other personally, so. Have you thought about writing any books yourself or just sticking to illustration? You no, know, it's, it's definitely a dream thing. I'm not really good with writing or words per se. I want to, I would love to, yeah, one day. Yeah, I, I don't know when I will feel confident enough to like, you know, write my own story, but I don't know, hopefully one day. <laughs> I, I want to, I just, I need to get better at it. It's something like I'm always thinking, like I did study a little bit better <laughs> this <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard you know oh, children's so books are easy hard. it's so hard it's so hard so looking at your books and you, you know you said old mcdonald had a farm and then i mean the one that if anybody searches you online the one that pops up is superheroes have have bad, bad days. days yeah that was my i think second or third book only no second book oh really that book got I think it's the superheroes effect there. Superheroes were like so popular then because the Avengers was out, like, you know, Marvel was putting a lot of movies. It became successful. And yeah, it does. That name comes up and there's going to be a third book now that I'm working on. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. How do you move into the professional world of children's books illustrator? You had talked about how briefly that you had gotten an agent. So how how does that work from... Once you're graduating, you're, you're looking to do freelance, you're applying for things. And then that, what feels like for a lot of illustrators and a lot of freelance people and artists, I've got an agent, so therefore I'm going to work. What is that like? And, and is that true? So for starting out, I think for children's books, there can be like a few ways to get in the field, but I can tell you like how mine work. I mean, you can pitch your own book you know, try to sell that and like get a start that way. Definitely like harder to start that way. I was like not into, or I wasn't thinking of writing a book back then. And it's something like the idea is occurring to me now. So I wanted to freelance and I decided to get an agent because when you're first starting, you don't know anyone. You don't know anyone in the industry. You don't even know like one name, you know, in the field. And an agent can expose you to so many publishers and art directors like, you know, very quickly. What's that experience like though getting an agent? Is it, is it easy or? Not at all. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it depends on from agency to the agency. And like, if you're knocking on the right door at the right time, it's always also about that. But for me, it wasn't easy. I, I applied twice to my agency and it's a, it's a big agent. It's a big agency. 
probably one of the biggest and that doesn't necessarily mean like generally for agencies it's good or bad but I love the artists that they represented and I really want to be one of them and it definitely takes a lot of research also like to find like where you fit better um anyway so the first time I applied I actually got a no <laughs> um I mean it was a positive no I, I used to call them positive rejection like you know, rejection the feedback <laughs> attached to it they replied very quickly the first time that they did love the work but I had very few like I had like eight pieces I was literally like straight out of school eight pieces they were like we need a like portfolio with like 20 to 30 pieces at least I'm like it take me a whole another year to like you know yeah d- develop those pieces so I worked another six months or so at least nonstop on top of the freelance I was trying to get and doing, you know, to just like make a living. And I, I kept building my portfolio and applied again. And the second time, I think I signed with them in less than three days, possibly. Like it was really quick. They remember that I applied before. They liked the work. And I think they love that I took the feedback, tailored my portfolio according to what they wanted and apply it again. You know, it shows passion, it shows determination, and it shows that like I really want to work with them. And yeah, it wasn't it wasn't easy to get in, but once I was in, it was like a snowball effect. Like I, they really introduced me to a lot of people, and I started getting work very fast. What was some of that first work that you got? Because I know for illustrators, there's a lot of different work that an agent's going to give you. Everything from live drawing and and that type of genre to actual illustration to editorial to things like that what was some of the first those early gigs they threw at you it can be really like any of those and it depends on the agent too. So some agencies like do only children's books some agencies do only like oh they're very strong in editorial my agency is because they have a lot of illustrators they they have a variety of clients that are you know from editorial to children's books like almost all of it so you can get any of those but again that depends on portfolio like it, you will get work resembles the pieces you have in your portfolio basically if you have children's books only then you'll be only getting children's books so i had a variety of advertising editorial and children's books so like in the beginning i was getting all of those fields or work from all those fields and um, I narrowed down the children's books more as I went, and now I get mostly children's books. With a children's book, what is different about doing a book? I know, it, obviously, it's a lot more images. It's a, it's, it's a story that's handed to you. What is different, and what are some of the pitfalls you, you find when you're doing a children's book versus, say, an advertising campaign or an editorial series? What, what makes a children's book different i think it's the, the sequential storytelling is very different rather than telling a story in one image is that easier or is that more difficult because it seems it seems incredibly hard to me i think telling a story in one image can be like incredibly difficult you know like you have to be a really master of storytelling to sell it that quickly and you know in a witty way the sequential storytelling also there's a lot of technical difficulties you have to draw the same character over and over again from like so many different angles and different actions and you have to really pay attention to the pacing of the story and the continuity and the, how the colors change from one page to another. And if you're repeating yourself, do you have the same composition over and over again or are you changing? You know, there's like, you have to think about 40 pages, say, rather than one page. You know, with one single image, if you like, you know, you, if you have the story right and composition right in one image, like you're good. But with the 40 pages, you have to get it right in every page. <laughs> <laughs> I think the amount of revisions is so much more, you know, with advertising, most of the contracts will say like, we'll have two rounds of revisions. It's in the contract with books. There is no such thing. It's like, we'll be, we'll be revising until we get this thing right. So that is sometimes like many rounds while you're sketching. And sometimes like, even though minor revisions after you finish painting, you might be still like revising things because it's, they see a mistake or they realize that they missed something, you know? Well, what are some of those revisions that are coming up in a, in a long form piece? So you mentioned compositional changes and colors. What, what are you seeing? What are they seeing that you didn't necessarily see in that, in the art creation? Especially in the beginning when you're first creating 80% of the time, it is about story. It's about getting the story, right? It's about getting the pacing of the story, right? 
it's about showing something earlier than you're supposed to do or, or later, you know, stuff like that. It's not like, oh, like you know, the character's hands or legs look wrong here. It's not technical stuff. And it, that is also because most uh, comments are coming from the editorial side of the team. So it's very focused on the story and the storytelling. Almost sounds like you're editing a movie. Almost, almost. Like, eh, exactly. eh, bring it closer, closer. Bring the bring the bring the arc a little sooner. Yeah, and the art director usually helps with the the color changes or like, oh, like can we have the colors brighter here or like I think or like maybe we can try this kind of composition here a little more broader revisions on the art, but it is literally eighty percent of the time it's about the story, just like it in a movie. So. Did you study movies or, or are you now thinking, well, maybe I could turn this into an animation? I, I didn't. I honestly didn't even study that much sequential storytelling. I should have. I, I, if I did art school again, I would have. <laughs> I, I had to learn and I think I'm still learning. I feel like every time I do a like storyboard for a, for a book, I, I learn something new every time. I think for a lot of illustrators or, or anybody that goes to art school, when you see children's books, and it just seems like the most fun you can have because it seems almost like you have carte blanche to do whatever you want just go nuts is that true or is it are you fighting a lot with the story it is n not true <laughs> i don't want to sound discouraging either like it is it is super fun and you can do a lot of things and you are giving a huge freedom of like bringing the visuals, the illustrations to the story. Like I'm never told what the characters look like or like what they want to see exactly. I'm just giving the story and they're like, here you go. You know, we want to see what you come up with. I mean, you're definitely hired to solve the problems visually. You know what I mean? You need to bring table, bring table, like what your vision, you need to bring your vision. That is literally what you're hired for, the ideas, the creativity you're going to bring. But there is definitely limitations because there's a story and there's a, you know, there's a reason why that book is being made. And you still have to like remain in that boundary. Like you don't want to step on anyone's toes, especially like, you know, the editor or the author. Like, it's not like they want to tell this story, but um, I think this is more fun, you know, than make your own book. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you said that in the most nice way, because I don't know about you, but I've heard it a lot of ways like, hey, make your own film, buddy. I don't care. Right. <laughs> That sets up kind of that next question where you're now working with a lot of existing IP. You're working on Star Wars stuff and Disney stuff. What's it like then now working with the big mouse telling you do it this way, but make it fun? Definitely those books tell you like Disney, Lucasfilm, Marvel, all of them. They tell you more. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a lot of hands-on experience. A lot of hands -on guidance. <laughs> Definitely, there are more limitations because you have to also like fit the what is told in the movies and what is told in the comics. Like especially with the Marvel ones, oh, they're the toughest because it goes through Marvel and then the TV studios and the comics and Disney. You know, it goes through so many people and different editorial teams that like you have you're handed like three to four PDFs for revision. Like it's almost like confusing. <laughs> it can be a lot, but um, you are still actually given, given a lot of freedom, like more than you would think, um, or I thought at least. And I realized it's actually very challenging to interpret these characters that already have really strong visuals, you know, like either in a movie or in a comic. But they want, they, they want these characters not to be drawn like the same way it was in the comic or in the movie, but they want you to interpret it in your own style. So you have to have a like strong sense of style already. So you can like take these visuals that are already like very established and like, you know, draw it in your own style. And you're very free that way and you, they, they want you to be. I know in, in comics, there's the, the Frank Miller version of this. The, the, there's different versionings of things. So uh, what are some tips that you found on working with existing IP or some stuff to you know, keep you sane when you're working with this pre-existing monolith? I really prepare myself for a lot of revisions again, like, and it can be like really minor stuff that you almost like, oh my God, is this really that important? Like, especially with Star Wars thing, like his helmet needs to be like half an inch shorter on this side. It's really small things, it can be. So if you get used to that, or if you, if you can handle that, and that's important too, like it's not definitely a personality thing too, like it might be too much for some. If you prepare yourself for like that kind of revisions, like a big, like long list of revisions to go through, then I think it's a fun experience. You know, if you like those stories yourself, especially like it's fun to nerd out sure. on those. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
recently did a Disney book called Princess Power, and it was all about she power told through the Disney princesses. And I got to watch so many cartoons. Oh my God. It was like, I'm like, this is the best job ever. <laughs> and then I would like pick a scene that I like, oh, I'm going to draw this one. And then stitching in front of TV. I'm like, I am so happy to be in this right now. <laughs> They're paying me to watch cartoons. How did I get this job? How did I get this lucky? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> And it was a fun combo too, because I the main character is actually designed by me, and the main character loves Disney princesses. So like you kind of have a combination of like watching all these movies and reinterpreting your own style, and also like creating your own character and like you know following the story through her and stuff. So it was a really nice mash up. Oh, that 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 must be fun to be handed a project like that. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. It was fun. Yeah. What are some of the of your favorite? characters or styles to draw then if you're you've done a lot of ip you've done a lot of other people's work you you definitely have a very not a set style but i can look at your work and go got it this this is her work what do you like doing that's maybe different or something that's maybe your favorite style to do style is in like stories like favorite story uh yeah stories or um you know like uh, there's a lot of work when i'm looking at a lot of your work you've got stuff that's very deep in the composition and there's a lot going on and it's heavily compressed and there's so much fun stuff going on i just love like crowded scenes for some reason i'm like in um, every time i don't know you're insane woman like why would you like that why would you like that i can like list so many things that i like doing because i i feel like i get influenced by different things every day it depends on like what i'm watching what kind of book i'm reading you know but i for like those crowded scenes for instance I forgot what it's called, Vimmel built in, like those old German illustrations where you, it's like very, very well done, you know, like there's like a million people. There is a a time period, so to speak, to your work. 50s for sure. Yeah. Not quite film noir, not quite 60s pop, but that in between, you know, it's a little conservative, it's a little wacky type fun thing that's just, it's super appealing. I mean, I can see why you're doing so many books. Yeah, I'm very influenced by the mid-century modern graphic era. It's fascinating to me how much they can simplify yet like tell very like complex stories, you know? And I always feel like simple is so much harder because <laughs> it's so, you have to learn the complex to like simplify it. Like it has a much longer process. But anyway, for about like stuff, what I like. So I, I did love those growing up, those German like illustrations. I think they were called Bimmel Builder if I'm not wrong, but, or Bimmel Builder. So that, Love. I also lived like grew up in like big cities, so I love like doing really crowded cityscapes and stuff. But I also always feel like I'm choking when I'm if I'm in the city for too long. If I'm so, I love the nature. I love like outdoors, climbing, hiking. So I feel like it's it depends on my mood. Like I love drawing nature and you know kids like like having an adventure in the woods or whatever. I think when I feel like I'm done in the city, <laughs> then I. And then I go back to my roots, like how I how urban I grew up, and then then I end up drawing like really com- like complicated like city scenes. <laughs> I just I just painted one night, and I was again cursing again at like a thousand hundred windows. <laughs> <laughs> why? Why? Why am I doing this? Why? <laughs> why is the perspective is so much harder? Like everything, and then then I would be like bored with like you know drawing really complex perspectives and painting like cityscapes then i'll be like doing really flat like very very mid-century looking more characters like almost no background or maybe zero background more flat images so i think like i just have the, this art- artistic needs artistic needs that i need to satisfy so i call co- i go back and forth which i think it's really good in the long run for your portfolio because you need a definitely a variety of stuff that are all like same or similar styles, but you want to show that you can do like complex compositions versus like more flat images, only characters, like close-ups and zoomed out, you know, all that. So different colored palettes and variety. Variety is usually the answer to everything like in, in any art field. So, so let's talk about then, you know, now, you know, we're stuck inside. What are those some tips that you can give Students and, and more and professionals alike, uh, you know, more professionals on, you know, living that freelance lifestyle. What are some things that you found 
that have really worked for you and, and definitely some of the things that for you were just like, yeah, this was a really bad idea. <laughs> I do love working from home. And one of the main reasons is because I get distracted very easily. Like I'm just like the presence of my husband right now at home is very difficult a lot of times. <laughs> I, I've, I've already told my wife, hey, don't come in here. Love you, but no, 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 not right now. I know. I, I love you, but I'm going to close the door. <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably really it will be really difficult for me to work at a place where you know you know one of those like open workspaces everyone works around the table that's like my nightmare <laughs> that's why it worked for me and I know I'm more productive when I'm alone already but I'm also actually like a very social person like I like talking to people and I am quite extroverted when it comes to like you know being in like social environment and what works for me basically is like working from home, being as productive as I can through the day. And then by the end of the day, like I got to get out of the house. <laughs> do you actually set a time, a working time for yourself? I do. Otherwise, like you either going to work forever or you're not going to have a productive day at all. So I kind of create a schedule for myself, which I'm very lucky to be like that flexible because I can, you know, shift the hours wherever I want to. Like I do set a time, like I work till five or so, like, and I really keep like an eight to five, nine to five kind of schedule, very similar people work. But I, if, if I have something I want to do in the morning or in the middle of the day, I can, you know, sh I can shift it. Like I've learned to be flexible too. And then when I'm done, I, I try to get out of the house and like meet people, see actual human beings and, you know, talk <laughs> and exercise, take a walk, go for a hike, whatever, because you're sitting and driving all day. So like moving and social interaction helps me. When you're working, what, what are some things you're thinking about that kind of spawn your creativity? What is, what's kind of driving you? What's, what's helping you in your creation process? What are some influences you're looking at? I feel like my experiences, like, you know, re real life experiences. Like I said, I love the outdoors. I love hiking. Um, so I drove from that experience a lot. And then I, I, most of the time, it's like, you know, like writers write about what they know. I feel like that, that is, it's the same thing for me. Like it's, I, I draw what I experience and it can be just an emotion or feeling that I put a certain, put in a certain setting, but it still comes from like, from what I experience. Like it might, like I have all these illustrations about my husband and my kid and it's, those are things that actually really happen. I just like put them in a slightly different setting and maybe make them more appealing, like especially say it's in, about my kid and if it's indoor, I'm not going to show my messy house. So you know, of course I should, I make it a lot more idealistic looking than it. <laughs> Have the two of them made it into a book secretly? Are they in the background? Oh, they're always in the book. Like they always like, like my husband, I mean, he's not at an age to understand, but um, my husband always like look for like, he's, he has curly hair, like looks for like the curly hair, which one is me? <laughs> <laughs> there I am. <laughs> Mainly, like I, I think what drives me most, or what helps me to create like new ideas, is like what I, what I really feel. And you know, I definitely have that artist personality. Like my highs are very high, and my lows are very, very bipolar. <laughs> so <laughs> artistic, artistic, very artistic. We artistic. We're artistic. I hold on to those high moments. Like I just, I really, I'm not saying that other people don't feel it, but when I feel it, like it's, you know, it feels intense, like in a good way. And I hold on to them and I try to draw it. And I, at this point, I also like know what people are looking for in, in a portfolio. And sometimes I will like, I will, I will want to do a personal illustration, but I also put it in a setting that also will like help me in the long run and like that I can use in a portfolio. You know what I mean? No, that, that's smart. That's a great piece of advice. I think personal work, your heart always shows in your work. And when you're doing a personal illustration or like an illustration that is based on your own feelings, like that, that shows it's always like, I don't know, some, for some reason it always feels, looks better to me. <laughs> I think that comes from experience. They, you always hear that in school and throughout. It's like, you know, put, put your feeling into it, put your heart into it. It's like, I don't want to. And every gig, every good gig I have gotten is always because of a personal work I did. It's always like, oh, I saw this work and it was great. Like, and you know, would you do this for me? Like it is, it, it was always a personal work. It's rarely commercial work. 
I don't know what this says about my commercial work. See now, you, see, now you have to figure out those things that make you super high or super low and go, hey, 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 I've got to draw a bunch of scary stuff. I'm going to go pick a fight with somebody. That'll work. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just watched a scary movie, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Thinking for students, because you do teach at the academy, and you were a student yourself, and you know these are those things that everybody kind of needs to hear, especially people that are helping support students. When a student is entering into art school, and it's, it's a little bit different than going getting a, a computer engineering or even just a general liberal arts degree. When you're going into art school, from your experience, what should a student really be thinking about? What's their mindset should be? Oh my God, they have to be really prepared for a crazy number of hours, weeks, months to practice and work. It's crazy. It's really like, you know, that's what you're going to hear every damn day. Like practice, 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 practice. It's so true. Literally, there's no shortcut. And it doesn't honestly matter like what level you start from. Like you have to practice so many hours and get to a certain like level. So you just have to be prepared for the amount of work you're going to put in, you know. It's not really like other schools. I mean, yeah, every school is every, every major is different, but it's not like those majors where you read like, you know, a bunch of books and you learn and then you go in the field and you're ready. It doesn't really work that way. And like some takes two or three years, some takes five to seven years. I don't know, like to get to the professional level. Everyone has their own pace of learning. But I mean, I, I was so happy when I got into art school and started the art school it's because I was also older so I had this like huge smile on my face I remember like at 4 a.m in the morning I was so happy to be still like working <laughs> it's crazy but it's the reality like you're not even like sleeping you're barely sleeping especially for a couple years it's so so difficult and if I wasn't passionate enough like I don't think I would make through you know like it's that many hours so I think anyone who's studying art school like has to know that is that's what it takes. And that is what you're expected to do too. Like really everyone expects you to work that hard, that long. So you get better. Like it's, you have to practice every day. I can think of those 4 a.m. things where you're just like, I'm still doing this, right? <laughs> you don't have that desire. Like you're not going to, you're not going to make it, you know, you're not going to make it out of the art school. Cause it's just, it's so much work. Yeah. Cause it's, it's a cutthroat industry. It's, it's, School's one thing, but work is... Oh, yeah, exactly. And it, it, that, that, that practice part doesn't really end. Like, I, I thought when I was in art school, like, it would be, you know, over. But you're actually growing so much more, especially in the industry, because you're learning more, you're practicing still every day. So you get better every day. But, like, I definitely, the curve in the beginning is, like, very steep and really hard. So that, that's that next question of, you know, now that you're, someone's going to graduate from art school, they've just graduated, they've got their diploma, it's the next day... Now what? <laughs> now what do I do? In school, you have like teachers. Everyone's giving you like feedback every day. You have, you know, friends that you're like sharing your artwork with and you're out of school. And in school also, like you're, everyone's helping you to like learn the skill. And then the school is over and you're on your own all of a sudden, like trying to get a, or get a job or work somewhere. That is hard. So for that, I think you, you need to be prepared for like all those no's and rejections for a while until you find where you fit, you know, and, and it happens if you, if you pursue hard enough. That was something you mentioned that I thought was so intelligent for people to think about was you're hearing no, not because you're bad. You're hearing no, because they realize this isn't you or that doesn't work or that's not a horrible thing. Yeah. I mean, it, but portfolio is really important. Like it's for art. It's not about like, how many years you studied, if you have a master's degree or a PhD or whatever, it's not like other fields, like what matters? It doesn't matter like how long it took you to finish the art school, like it's, or what GPA, you know, like it's, it's your portfolio that speaks for you. So until that portfolio is at a professional level and until that portfolio is right for whoever you're showing it to, you're, you're not going to get, get work. So that, like I call, remember like, um, positive rejections. <laughs> so those are key when you're first applying. Cause like a, a lot of people want to reply cause people are busy and like everyone's applying. That's like, it might be an overwhelming amount of emails for, 
you know, imagine say like everyone wants to work at Marvel, right? Like if, uh, just imagine how many artists are sending portfolios there. So they're not not going, they're not going through all those portfolios. So if you got to know, they actually looked at your portfolio. That's pretty good. So like remaining positive, it's really important. You can't take it personally, which is really hard if you're hearing no, like for a whole year, it's really hard to not take it personally. No, like I did, I took it definitely. But reminding yourself that it's not about you, that there are a lot of other things. It's not always about the quality of your work. It might be, but it doesn't have to be. So even getting an answer from someone, you've got to take that positively and like, you know, just pat yourself a little bit. Okay, that was that was a positive rejection. And then the best, best rejections are like the ones that, the ones you get feedback from. And it's really important. And that's actually like, like one of the main skills you learn at art school is like taking feedback. And that goes to your entire profession. And, you know, not just tailoring your portfolio, but also like when you're working, the most important thing is like how you take feedback if you can't take feedback, you know? So it's the same thing, like from those feedbacks, you have to tailor your portfolio according to the feedback you get. Even if it's a no, someone is giving you a clue about why it's a no. So like, no, no fix that, right? That's what happened to me too. Um, I, I got, I had a lot of no's. I, I got a lot of no's, but a lot of them also told me like what I was missing in my portfolio or what was wrong or what shouldn't be in my portfolio, you know? Or I was basically showing the wrong portfolio to the wrong field or in the wrong field. So I just tailored as I got all those emails and rejections or replies or whatever. And then eventually the portfolio was right. It's like a, like this organic thing that forms as you get rejected. <laughs> yeah. P- people forget that rejection is important. It's important. Being told that's not good is not bad. Yeah. It doesn't, they, and people are like not evil, you know, they don't tell you like, you're not good. You know, it's not that they will tell you why. And if they're not, if they're not seeing your email or your portfolio, you're not even getting a reply anyway. So it's, it's just, you know, take that feedback, apply to your portfolio and keep going. Like it's really important and do whatever like helps you to stay like uplifted and positive during that time. Like good friends or partners are really family, really important (laughs) those days. But once you hop over that, it's, it's great, but definitely I think that's the number one thing to be prepared for, like after school. Yeah, there are people who are very lucky that they get their like, you know, dream job, like right after school. You, you just got to understand that it's, um, that doesn't happen to like 99.9% of the people, you know, like that is very, very, very rare. <laughs> so, so to wrap it up, what, what are you working on next? What, what can we expect to see from you? What are, what's upcoming? I just, well, it's not just, I actually finished it end of last year a book called Helga or Helga makes a name and oh my god I love that book well I hope this doesn't sound narcissistic but it actually like it sounds like how I became an artist the story of Helga in the book oh very cool I'm very excited about that book I think it's coming out end of November it should be like you know towards the winter season and Helga is a Viking from a small small city so that's why it's like it's like you know everyone tells her basically that that she can't be a warrior because she's from a small city and she's supposed to be a farmer oh, that's awesome <laughs> but she leaves her town and like goes out to the big city and like and still does it you know goes through all these struggles and stuff i don't want to give the whole story but it's really cute i was so passionate about the story when i first read it that i'm super excited about it that is coming and a book I just finished will be out like a whole year later, but um, that it that I worked with a great team, and that one is called. You know what? I'm gonna cheat and look because I'm shooting blank. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah, the, new kid, the new kid has fleas, so that's the new kid has fleas. <laughs> it's really funny, just like the title, so that's really fun. Oh, that's gonna be great. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you so much. That was awesome. Yeah. You know, all that advice is really gonna help all of us, you know, students and working professionals alike. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for having me. So there you have it. Some more insight into the world of book illustration. Head over to facebook.com slash creative mind to get more information about these topics, as well as 
see some of our upcoming episodes, some of our past episodes. And if you've got some questions, please let us know. Leave some responses so that we can find out what you are most interested in. And if you've ever dreamed about a career in art design, more and more of these design and career opportunities are on the rise because employers are on the hunt for the next generation of talented and skilled creative professionals right now. And at the Academy of Art University, you will get those work-ready skills that employers want. You can study on-site in downtown San Francisco and, of course, anywhere in the world with our online degree programs. To request info about our 40-plus areas of study in art and design, including illustration, video game development, UX design, and more, just visit our website at academyart.edu slash creativemind. Thanks for listening. I'm Bobby Brill.